Welcome back to the channel. I'm Osborne Foreman and in today's video I'm going to be analysing Future PLC's stock. And this was actually a paid request on my channel by Robert or Roberto and he's asked to see what this stock is capable of and what my views are together. If you're interested in giving a suggestion for a stock to be reviewed, click the link description down below. So I'm jumping into their annual report to start. They mentioned that they are a global platform for intent led specialist media underpinned by technology enabled by data with diversified revenue streams. Now this is a really complicated way of saying what they really are. But I like to look at this wheel of monetization. I'm going to zoom in a bit on this. And effectively, this is how they're making their money. They've got content and data. So on their advertising revenue stream, they are making money obviously by advertising, AVOD and events and integrated marketing. They've also got uh, sorry, consumer monetization, which is CRM, news trade and membership and subs. They've also got platform as a service, which they mention is where they monetize their products via third parties, i.e. they license their content, franchise their business model, etc. And they've also got affiliate, which takes up 36% of the group's revenue, which is where they earn a commission uh, when an online user clicks through to a retailer or a service. Now I should definitely dive back into advertising because they are doing it on the revenue they earn from ads displayed our content on various platforms which is their own websites, social platforms, videos, email newsletters, magazines which they do produce physical and digital copy to, copies of and also events. Now when diving into the amount of brands they have they hold a lot. I'm actually going to zoom in a little bit here hopefully that will help us out a bit and there is 250 brands. Now you may recognize a few of them, you may not, but these brands in particular are, some of them are quite notable. In particular, obviously you've got Go Compare, very big brand, you can't really miss those adverts in the UK. Um, the Week, I believe is a decent news article as far as I'm aware, although not that big in popular. Metal Hammer, I know is quite popular amongst the metal community. Same with Classic Rock, and I know that a lot of the instrument-based magazines are quite popular. PC Gamer, for instance, is a big brand, especially in the online community and they used to make things like the Xbox magazine, I think it was OXM or something like that. And I believe they still have the PlayStation official magazine as well. But this is sort of misleading to just look at this because realistically a lot of these are, yes, going to be making money through their magazines, but where they're really making their money from is else where but their top 10 brands as apparently according to this which might be by total on your online users they've got tech radar again big brand tom's guide i think that's also i believe pc related i'm not entirely sure i don't follow that one games radar cinema blend life science and there is pc gamer as i mentioned before now in the last financial year they were able to grow their revenue by 79 percent however this is due to the fact that they've made mergers and acquisitions activity meaning they've actually bought another brand and i think they may have bought two brands because they definitely bought go compare sometime in the last year but i'm unaware of the exact timeline to boot Regardless, they are going to look quite inflated here. And so this is probably a misleading way to really look at this because you look at the growth of revenue thing, 607 million pounds in revenue. That's phenomenal. Fantastic. What growth? This should have a high premium. But in reality, they've used um, money, perhaps even some debt to acquire another business. Now, I believe this breaks it down here in terms of their acquisitions activity that actually they look for tactical, strategic and transformational forms of acquisition. This means they have the idea that if it's tactical, it's going to be content that they already have available. Same with the capability that's available and that the funding will be through their free cash flow. Now, tactical acquisitions are something I prefer because it means a business isn't necessarily being risky and they're being quite clever with it. For instance, Boohoo used a lot of their spare cash or net cash on the balance sheet to purchase the likes of Debenhams, Dorothy Perkins, Wallace and Burton. And I think these brands were very much beaten up due to the fall of Arcadia and they could retail it for a much higher price or at least make a lot more money on those brands and regrow them. With Future, they certainly can do that too. Although if I'm honest with you, I've not heard of Mary Claire, but they did this using their free cash flow. 
Now, what they classify as strategic is their acquisition on Dennis Group LTD. And there is a little bit more on that because they did acquire a few brands, but we'll be talking about that later. Supposedly, it somewhat expands upon what they have, but also existing. And so they took on debt to purchase this company. And with GoCo Group or the owners of GoCompare, in fact, they took on debt and equity to in order to do this. This meant that they released shares and I think that's why shares have been diluted by around 23% in the last year due to the deal with Go Compare Group. Now, I believe here this will tell us real raw growth without going too deep into the financial statement just yet. So the global audience, which I believe is their online users, is at 432 million, which is up from 394 million um, in the last year or the previous financial year before. However, I'm not entirely sure if this is actually monitored based on organic growth or if this is including their acquisition activity because if this is including ac um, their acquisition activity, then this really isn't that promising of a sign. However, in this case, I'm going to assume that actually it's looking at the organic. So it's looking at what their brands did or how they improved over the last year. And apparently the global audience was up 10% year on year driven by online users, email newsletter subscribers and social media followers. Social media followers is an interesting one to put there. But then again, they are a media company. So there is some credit there. Their online users in particular, hang on, how does this change? This is their total global monthly users to future websites. And that is 305 million, which is up 8% benefited from the acquisition of Cinema Blend, GoCo and Mary Claire US. On a CAGR or compound annual growth rate basis, online users have apparently grown by 58% since the financial year 2017 and that their revenue has also grown. But this is a combination of organic growth and the benefits of acquisition, as I mentioned earlier. So their actual organic revenue growth was 23% as shown down here, which don't get me wrong, is strong. That is strong growth for a company of this size. And it's something if you're looking for a company in the future to keep growing, that if they're able to grow by 20 odd percent each year, then it is a very good business. But you do need to look at the previous years. Yes, they likely would have had to struggle a bit in 2020. However, they were only growing by single digit percentages and low double digit. So perhaps the growth potential this year has been very high. And so it may come back into line after unless they take on even riskier acquisitions, more debt, release more equity by share dilution or selling more shares to shareholders. Now we're going to keep this in mind that organic revenue growth was 23% because we will be coming back to this later. Now their operating profit has obviously increased, but I want to see actually how that has increased. I believe I've gone back a little bit too far on myself here. I want to see how this has increased over a time period. So do we have this here that shows the organic operating profits? No. So they've shown that their leverage, which is their net debt ratio has actually been okay, but you can see it has increased quite dramatically in the last one to two years. But then again, as you acquire more brands and more cash generation, it's going to look lower over time. And that obviously their free cash flow is improving. But a shame here because I can't actually see how much their operating profit had grown in terms of without acquisition activity, but we'll dive into the financial statement to find out more. Now, when looking at, I believe, the geographical segmental review of their operations in the US, the online users have grown organically or actually declined organically by 5%. In the UK, their all, uh, online users have actually declined organically by 12%. However, when you've bought these brands into account, they've gained 16% in the US and 1% uh, in the UK. However, despite this, revenue is up by quite a significant margin. 27% organic growth in the US and 17% organic growth in the UK. This suggests that even though they're getting less online users organically going to their websites and their platforms and their media, social, social medias, that actually they're making more money per online user, which could be a promising sign suggesting that all of the users are more likely to spend money via obviously the advertisements or being redirected via affiliate marketing into e-commerce. And so this could be a promising thing, even though the online users isn't growing that much, and perhaps they could then use the money they make from these online users as they are to then be buying more brands to therefore build up inorganically the total number of online users, which then they can convert into cash. In a way, they've built up a web 
and I suppose, yeah, it is on the web, obviously, but they've built a web of different websites that all interlink cleverly and magazines, obviously, that mean that you are kind of caught in the web and you end up spending money all around it. And I think that's the best way I can describe it. In the US, the magazines are pretty much non-existent, but in the UK, actually, the magazines are quite popular and they did grow organically by 11% in the last year. Now, it doesn't say organic um, growth in operating profit. Now, I think that would be calculatable. I don't see why it wouldn't, but I suppose when you factor in, you would have to split up the expenses dependent on each business. And then was that expense really related to the acquisition or was it not? Because in that way, it would also change the figures up as well. But what we can see is that yes, their adjusted operating profit has grown by 81% in the US and 126% in the UK, but it's not really a figure that I'm going to be looking into. And you can also see their office locations with their HQ in Bath. They are in four locations in the UK, three in the US, and they're also in Australia and also the border of France, Italy, and also, I believe, Switzerland. Oh, go my geography skills, right? Okay, so now I believe this is the financial review and their statements. I'm going to zoom in a little bit here. Okay. So their total revenue, as said before, has increased. However, their revenue from these acquisitions is a substantial margin. So whilst their revenue in 2020 or their financial year 2020 was 339 million point six, and that has increased to 607 million um, in 2021, that actually nearly half of that is through the acquisitions, which and um, when you look at just an organic revenue growth, we're looking at something of about 48 million. And then if you factor in the year before and the fact they got the revenue from those acquisitions, how much of that truly is organic? Because does it no longer count as organic after a year? Which in a way makes sense because yes, they did own that brand and then they've been in control of that brand for a year. But is it truly organic or is it growing upon the brands that they bought? Which I suppose in itself is a good way of measuring the quality of the management, for example. Uh, let's go a look over here. So their cash flow and net debt. I find interesting. So their cash flow, uh, their cash flow from operations is 197.2 million, which is effectively double what it was in the previous financial year. Although some of it is related to exceptional items, which has nearly tripled in the last year, and that they have had an increase in accrual for employers taxes on share based payments, which makes sense in a way because I believe they've got now much more. And now I need to really interpret this correctly. I'm still trying to study and I've actually just started doing a SEMA course in uh, business accounting. But in my opinion, they've seen an increase in the accrual for the employer's taxes on share based payments, meaning they've put more money aside for employers taxes. So I'm suggesting in this way that either they've got more employees due to the acquisitions they've made, or perhaps that they are going to be paying more due to the overall revenue of the business. But again, this is a little bit out of my depth and that they've had lease payments of um, following the IFRS 16 leases, which again, this is not something I know about in particular, but that is of 6.1 million to a loss of their cash flow, but overall their cash flow is, or their adjusted free cash flow is 199.3 million pounds. So they are very liquid of a company and can easily churn that into more businesses and acquire many, many more. And when we look at their balance sheet, we can see here that their non-current assets do outweigh, I believe, their non-current liabilities. So, uh, their long time asset, their long term assets, for instance, their property, their intangible goods, and their deferred tax is obviously going to outweigh their long term liabilities, which is their interest bearing loans and borrowings, deferred tax, and provisions. However, I believe their current assets here, I believe, is let's have a look. The current assets is four hundred and twenty five point two million. Is I in, in as far as I'm aware double that of their total current liabilities, meaning that yes, their short-term assets do outweigh their short-term liabilities, but it is still quite a high amount. And that could be a concern to an investor about the amount of this. But then again, their current liabilities is well within their free cash flow after adjustments. Well, not well within, it's very close, but it can obviously be covered by their cash flow through operations. Now, the consolidated income statement would suggest that actually they've had a, a profit before tax of 188.3 million, although 
they've had a tax charge of £38.3 million, which is perhaps an exceptional item because it has dramatically increased in the last year. So I'm going to jump on something a little bit more easier to understand, which is simply Wall Street. Simply Wall Street I like the service of because it keeps things simple as it is in the brand. Now, immediately we'll look at the past performance, make it a little bit more clear. Their CAGR of their revenue over sorry, of their earnings over the last five years is 72.6%. Very good, but then they started at a very, very low point, which I think you're looking at what 2017 to now 2022. At that time, they were unprofitable, so this is going to look very inflated. And you might go, well, they only have 10.9% profit margins. That's quite weak, right? Well, you're going to have to look at this a little bit closer. Because their free cash flow is actually very high, if they weren't perhaps investing this money aside into other brands and acquisitions, that their earnings would be a lot higher. But I do think it is perhaps a little bit too premium for the company. Because when you look actually at the valuation, their price to earnings ratio is 60 0.4 times. When you look at their net assets compared to their market capitalization, it's 4.6 times. And if you look, I believe, at their enterprise value, which takes into account the same thing where it is their market capitalization, you add the total debt and you minus the amount of cash, I believe that enterprise value would suggest that if they were bought at the current price, it would be roughly 4.75, no, it'd be 4 billion and 75 million, which is a very, very big premium for a company that does have a low amount of revenue. So like for instance, on their company overview, you're gonna see that their price to sales ratio is 6.6 .6 times. This would suggest that they have a huge amount of growth in the future. Same with their price to earnings ratio. Again, the earnings could be artificially deflated because they might be investing a lot of their earnings so that they are able to perhaps be more tax efficient and then invest in more businesses and grow faster. But even then, that is quite a premium to uphold for a company like this. And when you look at the balance sheet in particular, as we did mention earlier, look at their debt to equity ratio. There is a lot of debt on the balance sheet of 58.1% and it has been dramatically increasing in the last five years. Yes, of course, the equity has increased too and that's due to their mergers and acquisitions, but it is certainly starting to snowball here and it would be a question of when would they like to start reducing that debt or are they going to look for the short-term growth, really acquire all of these brands so that hopefully they'll keep developing long-term and then they'll be able to pay off the debt with their then future cash flows. So perhaps it's more of a leveraged play on their growth potential in the future. And their cash position as well is about 324 million pounds. So of course, they're very liquid. This is a good sign. But again, they do have a lot of debt. So they're going to have to weave in and out and be quite clever. So you need to really be able to trust the management of this business in too. So I feel that they also pay a dividend. This is not really notable. I'm not really going to cover much time on it. It's not even 0.1% of a yield and that the current payout ratio is less than 5%. So they're reinvesting a majority of their money back into the business. The ownership though, and I hate that this happens, where you've got all of these funds selling in and out for whatever tax liability or reasons or their banking profits. But here, where is it? Where is it? You can see that actually in the top shareholders of the company, so you're looking at mainly funds here and some individual insiders. You can see that look at the change. And this percentage change here is the amount of shares bought or sold by the shareholder between the last two reporting dates. Look, these are all of Future PLC's top shareholders. See how they're decreasing their position size. Even they've likely decided that the shares have gotten a bit frothy, they're gonna trim profits and they're gonna bank it. Again, they might be, in a way, very dedicated to locking in their profits for the year so that then they have a good start, for instance, and perhaps that's why. Perhaps they're doing that as a way of going, right, look, bank my profits, I'm now not gonna have investors fuming at me for whatever reason. But this is a large amount. And in turn, we've seen the percentage ownership by institutions decrease over time. Now, I think it'd be quite attractive when the institutions have really lowered in their stakes there a bit, and there's actually a put, perhaps a push to buy again. But as I say at the moment, valuations are quite frothy. And this is obviously how I worked out their enterprise value. As I say, market capitalization plus total debt minus cash. However, it's not a good way to value the book assets of a company because it, it's effectively looking at the market capitalization. This is what the market would pay for it if it was bought. 
And let's say in a way you can also do enterprise value over EBITDA, which will tell you how much it would take to reach that uh, enterprise value using their earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. And ones that perhaps have better value than others, suggesting that for the value it could be bought out of the market, you could uh, get your money back in the total enterprise value quite quickly, would be considered more value stocks. And typically, growth stocks like Future PLC are not going to be in that category. And they're going to have a multiple of well over. 10 or 20, I believe. And here, so when they have agreed to acquire the portfolio of wealth, knowledge, and B2B pro technology specialists, brands of Dennis Publishing Limited for 300 million pounds. Now, I believe they did this in cash, and I believe that they also diluted shareholders in order to fund this. And I think what was interesting is that, yes, they had the week, which is a brand I pointed out earlier. But they also had a few other things. Minecraft World. Minecraft is one of the most, I think it is the most popular game, uh, video game on the computer. I understand why. It's a very simple but effective game. So it's not a bad one to buy. But then again, I've never heard of it, perhaps because I'm completely wrong demographic here. Although the brands retained by Dennis Publishing are Viz. Now, I'm guessing if you watch this channel, you know what Viz is. So I think... Perhaps that humor wouldn't go down very well in current day society, but I think it's hilarious. And to be honest, if I was looking to acquire this, perhaps they're looking to be more family friendly as a brand. I would 100% be trying to get Viz, revamp it a little bit, make it a bit more pushed to the front. And it might be a great way to show, you know what, modern society is like this. We're going to take the mick out of it, but it's a cartoon magazine, so you can't really go too hard on it, if you know what I mean. And I think that would have been a cool idea. But it was a good point to mention and we can see the share price trend over the last year as you can see it has had a fantastic run up this was my top performing stock in my 10 uk stocks to buy for 2021 and so it does i mean it has done very well and this also puts a point where the staff at the magazine publisher future share in a 10 million pound bonus pot which is great because it means more money is going back to the employees of the company and I believe this is due to their obviously the growth that I've mentioned earlier and I think there's roughly 2,000 okay it says 800 staff here and they will receive the bonus of 2,250 pounds so that is a nice amount companies that do give money back to the employees I think are quite good because these type of companies are obviously going to be um, ones that keep their employees more satisfied and by doing this they're able to perhaps maintain a better balance and these employees being satisfied may be a lot more productive and it could be a good thing overall for the business and when I go to my overall views of Future PLC I think it's a fantastic company as mentioned before if I can load this back up I'm still trying to get used to this new way of recording where we looked at perhaps their wheel of monetization they have a lot of digital income and I'm very, very attracted to this business model. I think it's very good. I would need a lot more understanding to really know what AVOD is. I would need to know what uh, CRM is, although I think that's licensing. or I think that is licensing, actually, because you get CRM keys on like video games, I believe. So I would just need to know a little bit more, really understand the business. But it isn't. It, it doesn't sound too complicated. People know what e-commerce is, and people know that clearly here they're referring people to services or products. They could be chucking an Amazon link in the description, for instance, for One Up on Wall Street by Peter Lynch. There is actually a link in the description for that. I'm not sure if it's for One Up on Wall Street, but I've definitely got two links for, for instance, The Art of Execution and Richer, Wiser, Happier. Book recommendations down below. Sorry, that got a bit too much into a plug. But on their wheel of monetization, I do like the business model. They do have a good split in terms of diversification of their income, advertising being 40%, premium content being 22%, affiliate being 36%. It'd be nice if their platform as a service, actually, it doesn't really matter if they improve their uh, monetization with other platforms as they're going to have lower margins because it'd be via third parties, but it does give them a good bit of protection in the form of diversification. But the company is simply too overvalued. It's a very, very pricey company trading at a price to earnings ratio of 60 times and I should have really looked at their free cash flow which was roughly about 199 million when you times that and you find the multiple of free cash flow to the market capitalization which from memory was about 3.94 billion you're looking at still a 20 times free cash flow to uh, market capitalization ratio which I think is very very much a premium valuation especially when you would take into account the 500 million pounds of debt on the balance sheet and the fact that they have about 320 million pounds in cash but it's not enough i by no means am a value investor 
but I feel that in a company that only has 600 odd million pounds of revenue that has to dilute shareholders in order to grow their revenue inorganically, even though they are getting some organic growth, I feel that this is quite destructive for shareholders. I think it's a very good quality company, but I think buying now at a price where I think it is very, very much of a premium may not be the time. But as such, it depends really on an individual's investment strategy. So how would they really deal with this? And I think in a way, if an investor is is, does really like the company and seen actually the, uh, the week perhaps um, PlayStation official magazine has been growing a lot lately or for instance they're seeing a lot more go compare coming up on websites where a lot more friends are talking about it and they really want to buy the brand which this may be a legitimate case then I think perhaps averaging in money and scaling into the position would be a wise move because I certainly wouldn't invest a lump sum it feels like it's at a premium and as I said before looking at the share price of the company which I need to go back to um, simply Wall Street here is is very much stagnating for now. It's likely trying to recalculate, it's likely trying to define how much their investor sentiment means to them. And at the moment in the markets, they've done well to hold as well as they have, but a lot of companies like beaten up growth stocks, such as my own, such as Boohoo, has gotten absolutely destroyed, although they are very disrupted by the current inflation in freighting costs. And really, they are they have a reason for their valuations to be pushed down. But a company like this, can they justify holding that premium valuation there isn't really a margin of safety to invest into here, so that could be a concern for investors. My final thoughts, this is 100% a stock on my watch list, but one I am not buying until that price to earnings, price to book and price to sales ratio really comes down in line or that their justified revenue and earnings is so predictable and yet so strong that it becomes a screaming buy. And if you're interested in how to earn £1,000 a month in dividend income, then click the card at the top right of the video. Thank you for watching. I'm Osborne Foreman. Have a fantastic day.